Hello, everyone. My name is Susan McCracken, and I will be your moderator and one of your presenters for tonight. I'm joined by Extension Master Gardeners Caitlin McKeegan, Ann Mason, and Carlotta Mulder. So tonight we're going to talk about the Messick Forest. Caitlin's going to start by talking about the trees of the Messick Forest, and I will continue to the, the discussion by uh, talking about the shrubs and saplings found in the Messick Forest, and Ann will then complete our discussion by examining the lower level plants. Then our panel will address your questions. If during the presentation or any of the discussions you have questions, please put your questions in the chat box. Carlotta will be monitoring those to present to our speakers at the end of their sessions, as well as during our general conversation time. So Caitlin, I think many people walk through the woods and never think about what might make a distinctive ecosystem. What's special about a Messick forest and the trees we find there? Thanks, Susan. Um, in preparing for this presentation, you know, I realized that I hadn't been paying attention very closely to the different kinds of ecosystems that might exist and, you know, the very small areas of really specialized um, plant growth. And so this was a really interesting subject for me to dive into, and I'm excited to share it with you today. So um, anyway, my name is Caitlin McKeegan, like Susan said. Um, I'm an Extension Master Gardener, and um, I'm going to introduce you to two kinds of mesic forests today. And I apologize in advance that my slides are not full of beautiful pictures. This is one of the few. Um, I'm going to leave that up to my, my colleagues to cover, but I wanted to give you a quick overview of what a mesic forest is, because I didn't know when I started um, you know, researching this presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so I had to look this up. I was like, what does Messick mean? And so in looking it up, um, you might have heard some of these terms before. I know I'd heard about Zurich Gardens, um, but Messick is part of a, a trio of terms that refer to soil types or soil moisture types. So hydric soils are typical of you know, wetlands. They're soils that are saturated with water or periodically flooded. And if you hear of a, you know, a plant that um, you know, grows in swamps and things like that. Those are plants that thrive in hydric soils. Messick soils, in comparison, are well balanced and they're, they maintain moderate moisture. They don't get flooded, they don't dry out. They're, if you think of like, you know, a nice shaded deep forest, you know, the soil is always moist, but it's not muddy. It's not, you know, crumbly. It's just this nice, it, and like, you know how a forest smells. It's, it smells moist and, and rich. So that's a mesic soil environment. Um, some prairies and savannas also have mesic soils. So it's not just, you know, damp woodlands that we're thinking of. And then, like I said, xeric soils, which you might've heard about, you know, I know if we go out west, there are a lot of xeric botanical gardens that are really, really cool to walk through. Um, those are desert gardens, they're dry. Uh, they don't get much precipitation throughout the year. And uh, if, it, if they do, that evaporates really quickly. So those plants are, are adapted to that soil type and don't need a lot of uh, constant moisture. Next slide, please. And then one other term that I kind of wanted to cover today because you're gonna be hearing a lot about native plants. What does it mean for a plant to be native and why is that important? So native plants are those that have formed symbiotic relationships with native wildlife. So, you know, in some of our earlier presentations throughout this year, we've been doing a lot of these virtual plant clinics with a lot of really great topics. You hear about specialist bees or, or butterflies. The example that always comes up are monarch butterflies. They are co-evolved to, um, they need milkweed in order to lay their eggs. And then their larva, the caterpillar, um, hatch and eat those plants. And so it's not only a nectar source, but it's actually habitat and it provides food for their developing young. So um, it, it's really important that we talk about native plants because they support our local wildlife. And I'm sitting outside. I know I'm in this like weird light, but you know, I hear all the birds around me, you hear catbird yelling in the background. The native plants that we plant support all of this life. So you'll also hear a term called exotic plants or invasive plants. They're not, they're not always the same. So exotic plants are just plants that are introduced from another region. We have a lot of plants, um, you hear a lot about plants that come over from Asia. They have similar climates, so those plants do very well here. Not all exotic plants are invasive, but some are. And when they 
tip over into being invasive, they can sometimes threaten these um, delicate ecosystems or outcompete our native plants, and they don't offer the same benefits to our wildlife. They do in Asia, where their you know, food webs are designed to live off of those plants, but here it's a little bit different. So anyway, this is not what this presentation is about, but I just wanted to cover this topic briefly because, like I said, all the plants we're talking about today are native to our region. So um, I will stop there. We'll come back to this in just a minute, but I'll go on to my next slide. So I forgot I had this one in there. One more plug for native plants, or several, uh, all these bullets on here. So native plants support birds, mammals, and insect populations the environment, they're matched to our growing conditions here. And that's shifting slightly with climate change. But for the most part, plants that, you know, developed to grow here, evolved to grow here, will thrive here. They require a little bit less care. They don't require watering once they're established. It's less wasteful, um, fewer pest problems. In fact, we kind of want the insects on these plants because it means that our ecosystem is thriving. They don't require toxic chemicals. They help manage rainwater runoff prevent soil compaction, help maintain healthy soils, just all kinds of good things. So um, I will now pause my native plant uh, speech and move on to move back to mesic forests. So there are two kinds of mesic forests. There's a mixed hardwood forest and a basic forest. And this was really interesting to me, and I'll, I'll come back to this later, but Rock Creek Park is a great example. I think all of us cited it in our research. Um, it was really interesting to read about that environment because there are mesic mixed forests there, but also basic mesic forests that occur in the same space of land, and they have some slight differences. So again, these are all pretty consistently moist environments, nice, um, you know, nice growing conditions for a mixture of plants, but mesic mi mixed forests tend to be more acidic. They're relatively nutrient poor. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're not you know, capable of supporting plant life, but it's just a different sort of soil type. The basic mesic forests have a different, it's not so much about soil pH, but it's about the mineral content of the soil. And so basic mesic forests tend to support a different grouping of plants. Some are the same for sure, but there are um, a much wider species diversity and things like that. So like I said, I'm sorry that my slides don't have more photos. I promise that we will, um, we'll get to some shortly. So next slide, please. So these are some of the trees of the mixed mesic forest. So there's an American beech, oaks, a tulip tree, hickories, American hornbeam, and flowering dogwood. But the one that I wanted to call your attention to is this last one, which is American holly, and it grows in more acidic conditions. And so American holly being present in, if you're in a forest, you're like, huh, this seems like a nice moist environment, you know, fairly, you know, well populated with plants, but there's a lot of holly, you're probably in a mixed mesic forest. Next slide, please. Sorry, I lost my notes here, guys. Um, so in the basic mesic forest, the dominant trees include, and I'll take a big breath here to read this whole list. There are tulip trees, there are American beeches, bitternut hickory, basswood, white ash, black walnut, northern red oak, uh, chinaquapin oak, which I probably said totally wrong, and I apologize for that, sugar maple, black maple, and southern sugar maple. So it's, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this environment, because of the different um, soil mineral comp composition supports a much wider diversity of species. Next slide, please. Okay, so in a basic mesic forest, and um, like I said, it supports a much wider species diverse community. So, and when we're talking about plant communities, these are plants that grow and support each other and have, again, have kind of co-evolved to, to need the same environment. So the basic forest is usually um, a lot more lush looking. There's a, a lot more plant cover. And these are places where um, the soil is nice and deep. It doesn't get washed away. It holds moisture, things decay. And so it's a nice deep um, soil mixture. And they're relatively fertile. Um, in many places, they're, they have an underlayment of bedrock. And so that contributes to these elements that, that make the soil really fertile. Next slide, please. 
So like I said, if you want to see both examples, um, I've called out particularly basic Mesic forest here, but you know, Rock Creek Park is a great example of a lot of mixed hardwood Mesic forests as well. There, um, on one of my uh, resource links, sorry, words are hard for me, um, there is a link to this page and you can read all about the Mesic Forest at Rock Creek Park. It's a very exhaustive article. It was really, really cool to spend time reading through that. And they point to a couple of great examples of the basic Mesic Forest. So you can see how that's distinctive from the mixed Mesic Forest. Um, but I thought this was interesting that it was 90, almost 91 acres that you can see of this basic Mesic Forest, which must just be fascinating. Next slide, please. So I couldn't let a presentation about trees uh, go by, especially this month, without pointing to our native advocacy, native plant advocacy group, Plant Nova Natives. They've done a ton of work advocating for native plants, and they recently, pardon my pun here, branched out to include resources that are dedicated to native trees. So if you go to plantnovatrees.org, companion site to Plant Nova Natives, um, you can you know, let them know if you planted native trees, have them count towards Fairfax County's goals. You can get information about which trees, some of these that maybe I mentioned in my presentation that you're interested in. Um, it's just a fabulous resource and, and I have to you know, give them a shout out here. Next slide, please. So before I pass it on to my co-presenters to you know, really get into the details about plants, um, I'm really sorry, I'm gonna do another terrible pun. I wanna give you a bird's eye view of, of how plantings work, just so you have a, an idea of you know, why we structured this presentation this way. So in a plant community, there will be, um, there's an above the canopy layer. So that's, you know, you see hawks and you know, apex predators up there. Then there are the canopy trees that we talked about, you know, tulip tree, oaks, things like that, really tall trees that form the structure of an environment. And then under those trees, we see all of the, the understory trees, the red buds, the uh, dogwoods, things that are really beloved in this area. Um, and then below that, yet again, there are shrubs and ground level plants. So when you're thinking about planting and planting for wildlife in particular, or building these communities like we see in the Mesic Forest, you really wanna have, you, you really, really wanna factor in all these environments. If we just go out and plant a bunch of beautiful, you know, ground level, Pollinator plants, that's wonderful for sure. But if you really want to build a rich, um, you know, wildlife supporting habitat in your backyard, kind of keep some of these structures in mind as you go through. So my next slide is just to show you the references that I use. Like I said, I have only brushed the surface of these subjects. There is so much more to learn and I'm very sorry if I got any of this wrong because I'm still learning. This is a subject that's new to me. So um, without, any further ado, I'll turn it over to my co-presenters to go into more detail. Ah, thank you, Caitlin. Carlette, are there any questions for Caitlin in the chat box? No, there aren't. Okay, that was fascinating. Um, and so now I am actually going uh, to kick off our neighbor to neighbor chat, uh, which in which Anne and I will talk to you about the understory of the Messick Forest. And that is the world beneath these ta this taller tree canopy. So I'm going to delve into the uh, the taller part of the understory, namely the saplings and the shrub shrubs that you might find when you walk through these woods. So the shrubs of the domestic forest benefit from that old growth, multi generational uh, growth of trees and the world that they provide beneath their canopy. That world will be Par, uh, part of full shade, either having dappled light that peaks in where small gaps appear in the canopy or in larger gaps that may have been created by uh, the loss of limbs of a tree or sometimes even the death of a tree through storms, lightning, or natural causes. That soil below is going to benefit from all of these losses, those dead trees and limbs, as well as all the leaves that are dropped. All of these will decompose and add those valuable nutrients to the soil. Mesic forest shrubs and saplings are going to grow in those canopy gaps and around the edges of the forest where that light more easily penetrates. Now, while we talk about some specific plants, the shrubs and saplings of the mesic forest share some general characteristics. Most of the shrubs or some of those small understory saplings are deciduous, which means that these plants will drop their leaves. 
annually. These plants are mostly shrubs, but can grow as small saplings, gener generally not growing more than 20 feet high, although there are a few exceptions. They produce flowers in the spring and many produce droops or fruits that contain seeds. I think we often call them berries. And these mature in the fall and give a color from reds to dark purples. Their leaves are gonna produce those fall colors, yellows, reds, and oranges. And they add to the fall, beautiful fall color of a mesic forest. Now these shrubs and saplings can also grace the home garden, fitting in very nicely in more naturalized areas. If the nature of the soil needs, moist, well-drained soil, and the light needs part to full shade are considered. Now that's not the focus here tonight, but it's something that you might consider. A quick note about the plants I'll be discussing. These plants are more likely to be found in the mesic forest in our areas. There are different varieties found in other regions, but those plants are going to share many of these general characteristics of the plants in this presentation. So we're gonna talk about the dominant and common shrubs uh, and saplings first. Dominant species are almost always present and in large quantities, while common species are usually present in relatively large quantities. In our Northern Virginia mesic mixed hardwood forests, these plants are often gonna appear and will appear in significant numbers. The plants you see pictured here are considered understory trees or tall shrubs. We start with the pawpaw. Now, I love this. One common name for this plant is the poor man's banana. I think that's, that's I had never heard that. I think that's great. It, it's one of the exceptions of the generally up to 20 feet. This tree can grow as tall as 30 feet. The fruit of the pawpaw is actually the largest natural fruit in the United States. Uh, one, one thing to remember though, is that it's going to take full sun to get that tree to fully fruit. Most people are familiar with the flowering dogwood, which is prevalent not only in the mesic forest, but also in our own yards and gardens. This plant's probably best known for its beautiful spring flowers, and it's kind of going to kind of grow along the edges of, of the forest. The American hornbeam is another tall understory tree growing up to 30 feet, kind of like the pawpaw. At one time, the wood of this particular tree was used to make bowls, handles, and, and this will give you an idea of how long ago this was done ox yokes. Today, unfortunately, it's too scarce to be used for real commercial use. The mountain laurel is a dense rounded shrub growing up to about six to 10 feet. As it ages, this shrub kind of opens up and develops these gnarly branches, giving it a really interesting look. The maple leaf by Viburnum is a lower shrub and it reaches maybe a height of six feet. The maple leaf is more shade tolerant than most viburnum, so it really does lend itself to that understory environment. Now we're going to talk about sparse plants, and these are those that are usually present but are found in smaller quantities. And we have tall and lower shrubs in this category too. The tall shrubs uh, include the strawberry bush which gets its name from those really showy sort of warty capsules that you see there. And these eventually split open to expose the seeds. The Northern spice bush is so named because of the spicy odor produced by the leaves when, when you crush them. Um, its berries also are a little bit spicy and they have a little peppery taste. This bush will grow eight to 15 feet tall or so. The downy service berry is actually in the rosea, uh, rosacea or rose family. This understory tree can grow as tall as 40 feet in the wild, but, but typically this grows more like 15 to 25 feet high. Now the wild azalea is also considered a tall shrub, although you typically don't find it all that tall. It, it, you'll find it more in the two to six foot range. The arrowwood viburnum, we do have a lot of viburnums in, in uh, the mesic forest. It can grow about five to 10 feet. And as you can see, this plant has a really beautiful white, small white flowers that they mature in these flat topped clusters. And these clusters can be like up to four inches wide. It has 
bluish black droops and that they mature in the summer and early fall. Uh, our last viburnum here is commonly called black haw and it can grow, I love this, up to 20 feet tall and 20 feet wide. Uh, its spring flowers are really large white cymes and cymes are a cluster of flowers where the plant sends up a central main flower stem and that develops first and then lateral stems follow. And what happens is you see that beautiful cluster look of the flowers. So now we're going to talk about the lower growing shrubs of the Mesic forest, lower growing sparse shrubs of the Mesic forest. And these are the low bush blueberry, the common dewberry, and the wild hydrangea. So we start with the uh, low bush blueberry. This plant really only grows about two to three feet tall and two to three feet wide. One important note about this plant is that it easily hybridizes with other blueberry plants. So that the leaves, the flower, and the fruit may actually vary in size and shape. The common dewberry is a bit prickly, literally. This family, Rubus, includes blackberry, dewberry, and raspberry. So we can expect to find bristly stems on this plant. Now it can grow up to eight feet tall and, and it has kind of an erect or arching form to its shrubs, but it can also be a woody vine that can be like as long as like 15 feet long. Finally, we have the wild hydrangea. Now this plant really does prefer part sun and will only tolerate full sun if it has consistent moisture. Before I finish, and this white page is white for a reason, I'm gonna fill it. I wanna call attention to not just the diversity of shrubs and saplings in the Mesic forest, but also to just how important this environment is to the wildlife that inhabits it. So we're gonna use the maple leaf viburnum as a stand-in for many of these plants. In the spring, we see that these plants produce flowers and these flowers feed insects and attract important pollinators. In the summer, when fully leaved, habitats are provided for many birds, as Caitlin said in, in her presentation, but also for other kinds of insects and animal life, animal life. In the fall, most of these plants are gonna have matured roots, and these are critical food sources for birds and animals. At almost any point in the year, the Mesic Forest provides a vibrant, beautiful, important, and possibly fragile ecosystem that we should both appreciate and work to preserve. Now, most of the descriptions of shrubs and saplings came from the North Carolina Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox. If you want to adapt any of these shrubs to your home garden, there's good information there about how you can fit them in your landscape. My other resources are listed here, and I, I encourage you to read some of the articles to appreciate just how important, precious, and often at risk this showy forest is. So, Carlotta, do I have any questions? I have box? a question. Okay. And, um, actually, this could be directed to any of the three of you. What types of changes are we seeing with um, the changes in the weather? Um, as far as native plants, are we seeing um, other plants coming in that might become more adaptive to the changes in weather? And how is that going to affect the, um, the local biodiversity, so to speak? Okay, um, uh, other presenters, please feel free to unmute and, and join in the conversation. But yeah, we're gonna see some changes. Um, from climate change as, as trees move, plants move north, and southern plants move up into our area. Um, I, I also, before I turn it over, I also want to add that, um, you know, as more of these areas are claimed for development, that really has an impact uh, and changes the whole scope of, of what these forests, wh whether these forests could even continue. And Caitlin, what would you like to add? In uh, Master Gardener College this year, there was a discussion exactly uh, about the question of what climate change will have in the years to come. Uh, 
we can expect there is a new hardiness zone map that's under development. So we can expect that we can see the shift of our zone A, 7A, um, perhaps being more a 7B over time. That's not gonna happen right away. But I think as, as we see the, the climate and the temperature shifting, that is the freezing and the, 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 the springtime frost and the fall frost uh, changing, we're going to see some things, plant life moving upwards. Plants are easier to move than wildlife habitats. And so we're, some of the animals are actually going to be shifting in response um, earlier than the plants. And so what we're worrying about right now is making sure that as the, as the birds and animals shift because of the temperature, that the plants are also shifting to support their habitats. Um, so this is a big conversation that we'll be talking over the next few years. Um, it's, it's. Yeah, and I was interested, uh, especially because my next question was going to be about the zones and, and how we're looking at any changes in the, in the hardening zone. So thank you for that. Uh, stay tuned. That's not ready to come out apparently yet, but the USDA and other scientists are working on it. They didn't give us a timeline about when that might come out, but they are working on it. Thank you. Caitlin, did you want to add anything? I just wanted to kind of add on what Anne has shared. I've also read that, you know, it's, we're not, we don't fully understand quite yet what the effects are going to be, but, you know, we're seeing these extended periods of drought and then inundations of, you know, a tremendous amount of rainfall in a really short period. And that can strain plants that otherwise are used to a more, uh, you know, regular influx of of smaller amounts of rain and more consistent moisture. And so, you know, we are seeing some plants that are a little bit more delicate that are not responding as well to that stress. Great, thank you. Kalana, any other questions? Not at this time. Okay, great. So now Anne's gonna describe those plants that we might walk over and not even notice, but that deserve our attention nonetheless. So Anne, Talk to us about these beautiful plants. Thank you, Susan. Well, I'm hoping that we'll act after this talk, we'll, we'll actually look down and see them more. Um, the lower level plants in the music forest, and I think Caitlin did a great job in setting the stage for all of the different layers in a forest. A forest needs all of these different layers in order to work well as an ecosystem. So, on my next slide, you will see that there is on the forest floor, it's characterized by a lot of low sunlight. In the mesic forest, it's damp. It's got decaying leaves and twigs, animal scat, and lots of mosses. But in addition, my next slide so shows that it also has moist soils. It's acidic, but it, in the basic uh, mesic soil will have a lot more cations from the carboniferous minerals that are in the soil. There, the soils that we're going to see are, are range from relatively poor nutrient soils in the mesic forest to really lush soils in the basic mesic forest. And we're going to see a lot of patchy growth on the forest floor. Now what are we going to find there? We're going to see herbaceous flowering plants. We're going to see ground covers. We're gonna see lots of ferns. We're gonna see some woody vines and we're going to see some grass, grasses, rushes and sedges. In my next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of these lower lying plants are, but I'm going to focus it and organize it around the seasons, because that will give you a better idea about what you're to look for. In the springtime, before the canopy have, has set out, you're going to find a Virginia spring beauty, which is a member of the purslane family. And you might 
look down and see these lovely white or pink flowers with dark st pink stripes on smooth grassy like leaves. But look carefully when you see it. This plant is going to disappear. It's what we call an ephemeral. So after it sets its seed capsule and that ripens and discharges the seeds, this tuberous wildflower will go away. And you will be, that hole will be not, will be filled by other things. Now look for this Virginia spring beauty blooming from January to May. The May apple, I look forward to every year in my yard. It grows in compacted soil. It's a creeping rhizome that has tubers underneath and the Native Americans used to dig up the tubers and eat them like potatoes. They form large, dense colonies. So when you see a set of uh, May apples, you will see a whole area just covered with these lovely umbrella green like leaves. There'll be one or two um, leaves on a stem. These will emerge in the springtime before the leaves of the trees that they are under. The flowers will be in April or May and these have a short life, also an ephemeral. Bees love these flowers and you can see the flower in the middle picture. Um, it, it for, when it ripens, after pollination, it ripens and it turns into a golden colored apple-like fruit that is eaten by turtles and spread around the yard by seeds. It also self-seeds, um, but it doesn't like competition. So I've often thought in my yard, how can I fill in this large gap when the May apples die? or rest for the summertime. And I dare not put anything around it because springtime isn't springtime until I see these May apples coming out. My third is a jack in the pulpit. Now this is not necessarily an ephemeral because you can still see them now. It's a member of the Aram family and it is pollinated by small flies. You'll see the flowers in March through June. And these seeds of the Jack in the Pulpit will come out in the fall. We'll have another picture of that in, in our fall sequence. It needs more seasonally moist, wet temperature. And what, I mean, ground cover. And what you wanna do is, if you have Lars so Luckies to have Jack in the Pulpits, keep those leaf litter on top of it. There's no reason to pull that off. They like that um, winter cover in remaining in place. So now let's move to some more spring flowers. You'll see the violet. This is not an ephemeral. The, it self seeds and it also spreads through rhizomes. I enjoy the violet because it is a ground cover in a woodland garden. However, some people look at violets in their lawns and want to remove them all. The woodland garden it really is a wonderful place to let the violets grow. The round-lobed hepatica is an anemone that blooms from April to May. And it is a great spring blooming and I hate to say flower because those lovely petals are really sepals, neither showy sepals of this plant. The flowers are actually in that yellow area in the center. Now, you can tell what the weather's going to be like because this flower will close during rain and at night. Now, sweat bees and flies love this clumping ground cover. My third picture on this slide is a member of the lily family. And you can see it has tubular flowers that turn into blue berries 
in the when they ripen. They, this blooms in March through June and it has rhizomes, but it is not a colonizing plant. So very often you're going to see singular or just small clumps of the smooth Solomon's seal. Continuing on in our spring festival of flowers, the bloodroot has white flowers rising on a separate stem. Now this stalk could be 12 to 14 inches high. This flower also opens in the sunshine and closes at night. And it is a member of the poppy family. Moving on to a member of the mustard family, the cut leaf toothwort is an ephemeral that only lasts a month. So if you see it, just enjoy it for that moment. It has a single stem that rises from a segmented rhizome. And you'll see that the leaves are in whorls of cut leaves. It has white flowers and it blooms April to May. Moving on to the hairy, hairy sweet Sicily, a member of the carrot family, you see that the flowers are compound umbules that are like little, little clusters of flowers. The flowers are on a one to three foot stem, on a solitary stem. And when it blooms from May to June, but when you brush it or bruise it, it's going to smell like anise. Now moving on into our lush summertime, you will see our ferns, lots of different types of ferns. The one fern that everybody agrees is a mainstay in the mesic forest is the Christmas fern. In the springtime, you will see the fiddleheads emerge. This fern is not fussy about soil type. And when its first fronds emerge in the springtime, the ones that are stiff and held upright are fertile fronds. So the spores of those fertile fronds will help disseminate the, fr the fronds elsewhere. They're followed by shorter sterile fronds that are loose and arching. And so this Christmas fern provides four season interest. So this is an evergreen clumping fern. Now the other ferns that I like on this list, uh, the one I'm particularly in love with is the lady fern. It is a slow growing fern that spreads by rhizomes. It has graceful two to six feet uh, fronds with the fronds are held by green to reddish um, stalks, but it is not winter hardy. It drops its leaves at the first, front, first frost. Moving into our summer um, uh, flowering season, the next so slide shows the self-seeding annual that blooms, uh, in August, and it grows two to five feet by August, rather. Um, it flowers midsummer and all the way through frost. But be careful with this. This is a aggressive competitors, and when it likes a habitat, it takes over, even pushing out the garlic mustard, which is the bane of most gardeners. This this orange jewel weed will just walk all over it. Now this is flowered um, by insect, by pollinated by insects or hummingbirds and it needs to be cross pollinated. Each of those flowers needs to be cross pollinated. Moving into the middle picture is a member of the mint family. This will grow up to five foot tall it flowers July, August, and September, and it likes a more neutral pH. It has rhizomes, and this perennial flowers will have a, a lemony odor. 
The enchanter's nightshade grows in dappled sunlight or in medium shade. And you see it blooms early in July. The mature seed capsule has a self-hooked hairs to help distribute the seeds. And this will grow one to two feet tall. And you might think, well, after this cacophony of flowers, is there anything left for late summer and fall? In come the asters. The two members of the asters family that we have here are the pale woodland sunflower and the white wood aster. Asters are really important for our pollinators because it pro they provide a nectar and food for when other flowers have stopped blooming. The pale leaf woodland sunflower can grow three to seven feet tall, and the flowers are in loose clusters that bloom from July to September. The white wood aster is a smaller aster, grows two to, th two to three feet tall, but it spreads two to four feet wide as a mounting perennial in a, having a dense rhizome. You'll find this in the open woods or on the edges of woods because it needs about three hours or a little more of sun. Now it can self seed readily. And so some people think that it gets weedy, but it flowers from September through November and it is hosting butterflies and bees. In the springtime, you cut this back to about six inches in the late spring. And I promised a picture of the seeds of the jack in the pulpit. These seeds are, are, you can see the jack in the pulpit most of the year, and these seeds need to cold stratify so that they can form new plants. Well, what about evergreen under, undergrounds? There are three wonderful evergreen plants in the Mesic Forest. The first is on the left, the partridge berry. And you will see this native perennial as a small woody vine that, that trails along the forest floor. It blooms in late spring to early summer. And you'll see in this picture a pair of flowers that need to be cross-pollinated. One is a female flower, the other is a male flower. And they need to both be pollinated to form a single red berry. These seeds need cold stratification before they will germinate. And they can germinate in the next season or in the second season after forming the berry. One of my most favorite plants in the forest is wild ginger. This evergreen is a, a um, expands by rhizomes about six to eight inches a year where, where in places where it's happy. It has early spring flowers that are mostly hidden, but they are purple and they have these long spikes on the end. It's, they're all flowers, but, but they are pollinated by flies. Now, one of the things, and they bloom very early in the spring, the seeds are spread around by ants. So if you not want to know where your ant populations are, you can just follow the movement of wild ginger around your yard. And the last one that we'll cover of the evergreen category is Virginia heartleaf. This is a clumping plant that blooms from April to June and the seeds are brown and this has a rhizome. And what would the forest be without woody vines? Now, these are not my favorite things in the forest, to be honest with you. Virginia creeper is probably my most favorite of this group. 
but it is a member of the great family. It climbs by tendrils with discs that fasten onto whatever they're climbing, bark, trees, um, buildings, rocks. And because they have adhesive discs on the end of their tendrils, they don't do as much damage to the building when you pull it off as other vines. Now I have lots of Virginia creeper in my yard and I've never seen a flower, but their flowers are very inconspicuous in the springtime. And those flowers turn into one quarter inch bluish fruit, which I've also never seen in spite of the plethora of this stuff in my yard. And what would we do without another member of the grape family in the forest, the riverbank grape, which is a woody vine and it spreads by tendrils that can climb up other plants. And when it does, the leaf cover is so shady, it can kill other plants by starving the sunshine. The flowers are of separate gender and the fruits are black and blue berries that hang in clusters, much like we would expect out of a grapevine. Now, there's a benefit to this plant in the forest because insects and caterpillars love to feed on the leaves. My least favorite plant of the woody vines is the spiny, stiff-thorned vine of the greenbriars. And there are lots of different kinds of green briars as a group. They have extensive knobby rhizomes that if you've ever tried to pull them, out, pull them out of your landscaping beds, you will find it to be a very difficult task. And they are fast growing. What you'd be interested to know is that their tendrils are really modified stems. They start off green, and if you don't pull it off, whatever you don't want it on, once it hardens, it's going to wrap around, it will wrap around the plant. And once it does that, those green pliable tendrils will turn into woody wraps around your plant. Now this is very hard to kill because it has a waxy leaf. So if you have more, if you want to kill this, you'll have to come back and talk to us individually because we're going to be having to look this up in our pest management guide for the most current way of killing this if you cannot dig it out. And then everyone's favorite is poison ivy. Leaves of three, let it be. And this is a plant that everyone should recognize in the forest, but not everyone does. It is a woody vine that has alternating leaves. And the leaves can be mostly three, leaves of three, but it has been known to have multiple leaves beyond that, three, five, seven, nine, um, according to the university scientists. The leaves can be smooth like the one you see in the image, or it can be uh, toothed, which is the one we mostly look at and see. So it's a bit of a chameleon on the, the leaf. So it's, you need to be very attentive to what you touch and what you don't touch in the forest. Now, as we go to wrap this up, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we look at the forest. As Caitlin and uh, Susan mentioned, the forest has a, a lot of diversity and the biodiversity in the forest is what makes it wonderful. But say you want to replicate a forest or, or uh, take part of maybe if you have a woody yard and you want to create a bit of an ecological forest, you need to be looking at what are the common plants, what are the dominant plants, and what are the other kinds of plants so that you can plant them in the right kind of balance? Everything in a, in a forest is about balance. Um, in our landscaping beds, we often say we want all coneflowers or all 
um, sunflowers or all types, one type of plant or another, creating a monoculture. A forest is much more diverse than that. So on the next slide, you will see that there is a database of species across native species that you can decide how you want to cre create or renovate your yard or your, if you live on the edge of a forest, what you might want to plant there. So here you have a oak heath forest, an oak hickory forest, a mesic forest, and a wet forest. And this database allows you to see what are the types of plants that you might and what are their categories that might fit into your location. So this is, as you're thinking about planting in a forest or restoring a forest, this becomes a very good um, database that you can look at to see what you might consider. So native plants have a lot of diversity and a lot of importance, as we have all mentioned. And it's important to get the balance right. My resources are similar to the ones that, that my colleagues have used. And that is a tiptoe to the basics of the mesic forest. Top to bottom. Wonderful. I just wish that we had more questions. I don't have any, I don't have any questions, but I really enjoyed the presentations of all of you. And I, I thank you so much. I know that was an awful lot of work. It, it was a wonderful experience. I think I can speak for everyone. And, and, and I want to say that was beautiful. Uh, wow. Thank you for that presentation. <laughs> I knew you. I was, I knew I was stepping over beautiful plants, but I had no idea I was tipping over so many. <laughs> well, and many of them, you need to get there at the right time because it's a tempest fugit. And in these cases, some of these spring blooming ephemerals are fugit. And you really, if you're, if you're looking to go to the forest and see these, you really need to be there at the time when they are present because otherwise they are sleeping, gaining energy and for their next emergence next spring. I have to brag because at my school, we have some wonderful spaces where I can take my students out and we can look for these spring ephemerals and they are as, they are as in love with them as I am. It's just really wonderful to be able to to share that experience with them. wonderful Carlotta. Yeah, I think it's amazing. It, it's really amazing to think about how much we miss when we're trying to take everything in. Mm -hmm. 